Good evening, everybody. This is the Carver Zoning Board of Appeals. We are meeting in room number four at the Carver Town Hall. It is May 3, 2022. We're starting at 7.03 tonight. May, uh, I'm sorry, May 10th, not May 3. Um, I worked on May 3. In any event, it is May 10th, I assure everybody of that, and a couple of minutes after 7 o'clock. As is our usual custom, we will address the meeting minutes first from our previous meeting of May 3. And I want to inquire of everybody whether they've had a chance to review those minutes. I yes. have. Yes. 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 Does anybody want to make any changes, amendments, or modifications there too? I do not. No. No. Everybody good? So do I hear a motion? I move that we accept the minutes of May 3, 22 as written. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I observe our clerk here tonight who's smiling at me. It's nice to see. Uh, there was one typographical error that I caught before we just voted on these. Okay. So I'm going to leave a copy with you. you want to get, you come and get it. You can get it. Oh, I'm sorry, Jill. Sorry, sorry. So that's that's the one that we just voted on, okay. and it was a it was a grammatical typographical error. Can you send it to me in Word or so I can change? Oh, you corrected it. I did. Okay, perfect. Less work. Okay. We have a case on tonight, and. Who's got the agenda, Andy? I have it here. I got it. This is a continued public hearing, case 32-1-A, one dash one, one dash two, one dash three, one dash four, one dash five, dash sixty. Um, for all those lots, the petitioner is Margaret Sheehan on behalf of Save the Pine Barrens. And uh, she is appealing the denial. Uh, actually, she is appearing on behalf of Save the Pine Barrens, Inc., appealing the denial of the building commissioner for enforcement of the town of Carver zoning bylaws with regard to earth removal activities on land owned by Ricketts Pond Business Trust said activities allegedly occurring at property located on Spring Street, Route 44, Carver map, Mass, Assessor's Map 32-Lots 1-A, 1-1, 1-2, 1-3, 1-4, 1-5, and 1-6, in the <coughs> Spring Street Innovation District, pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, Sections 8 and 15, as well as under Sections 2230 and 5223 of the Carver Zoning bylaw. That is the case on for this evening. Um, before we begin tonight, I do want to comment on uh, something that happened this afternoon, and that is the uh, planning department received at approximately 1 p.m. Is Donna here tonight? Donna Brewer? No, she is ill. She has COVID, so I'll be speaking on behalf of Okay, I'm, uh, uh, please uh, express our concern and well wishes to her. But in any event, uh, we received a correspondence, uh, or at least the planning department did it about 1 o'clock this afternoon. And this was in the nature of a uh, legal brief. It was single-spaced. And it did not come to my attention because of my court schedule until 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, I don't believe that any other member of the board has had an opportunity to go through this yet either. So I suggested, and I must tell everybody as well, that I have not looked at it. I just have not had the time um, with such short notice. So... Um, I reached out through the planning department again 
to Ms. Brewer, who is counsel for the petitioner in this case, and uh, advised her that on behalf of this board, I was taking administrative action, which I am entitled to by virtue of the fact that I'm chair of this board. And what I suggested was that the petitioner consider a continuance to allow this board the opportunity to review this very late filing. Now, I have said many times before, not just on this case, but other cases as well, that this board is meticulous about its preparation. And we go through everything on this case and as well as others. This is the other part of it. But we are not able to address um, intelligently this late filing by Attorney Brewer. Um, so through the planning department, I inquired of the petitioner whether they would like a continuance so as to allow us the opportunity to review this. And the response came back from Attorney Brewer that uh, they did not want a continuance, that they wanted this matter to go forward tonight without a continuance. Now, before we go any further, I observe that there's counsel here for uh, the developer in this case. Is that true? Could you identify yourself? Yes, sir. My name is Bob Ferguson. I uh, represent SLT and RPBP LLC. Okay. Were, were you made aware of this late filing by the petitioner? I did receive a copy of it this afternoon. And approximately what time did you get it? Uh, I can verify if uh, I check my email, but probably at 1 o'clock or so, whenever it was sent, okay. I emailed to Ms. Martins. Okay. Um, and I observed that Ms. Martins is sitting in the front row. From whom did you initially get this late filing? Was it from Ms. Brewer or yes. was it from Attorney Ferguson? Uh, the first name. Brewer. Uh, Attorney Brewer. Brewer. Yes. Okay. So it appears as if counsel on both sides uh, was sent this and apparently uh, was made aware of it as early as 1 o'clock today, but I can tell you that um, the first notice that I had of this was at 3 p.m., and I don't think any other board member has seen this no. yet either. First I'm hearing of it. Yep. No. Same here. So this presents a problem. I have addressed this issue before with other petitioners, and I'm going to address it to both of you now. This board takes a dim view of such late filings because it causes us to be ill-prepared for the argument that is going to be forthcoming from you tonight, Attorney Sheehan, or perhaps even you, Mr. Ferguson, Attorney Ferguson. So I want to ask you, Attorney Ferguson, first, whether you uh, feel that due to the late filing, you would like a continuance, a short continuance of this hearing, or whether you are prepared to go forward tonight. If I may, um, a moment to confer with my client? Absolutely. And you can step out if you want. We don't want to overhear anything. <laughs> That's fine. I appreciate that. Um, and, and to the panel, thank you for that opportunity. We are prepared to go forward tonight. Okay. So I want to uh, tell you, uh, Attorney Sheehan, that we will not consider this late filing tonight as part of this hearing. Should this hearing go over to another date, we will be happy to consider it. But for purposes of this evening, that late filing will not be either uh, reviewed or considered based on what I've just said. Again, we're happy to review it should we need to come back at a later date. And I hope you understand this. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have a problem with that. Tell me what your problem is, Vice Chair <laughs> Clark. They have submitted documentation that was meant to go to this board during this hearing. The fact that we haven't had time to look at it means nothing to me. It, it means that we haven't had time to look at it, whatever they say or whatever he says today, 
that's in conjunction with whatever may have been filed. It, it, dis it, it disturbs me enough that I could very well get up and leave right now and leave you with a board of four. We don't want you to do that. But this is disturbing, and we have addressed this issue before. We've addressed it with them. <coughs> with them. I'm sorry. In them. a prior Excuse hearing. Me? In, in our previous hearing, there was a very late filing. In oh, I, I in know which one you're referring to. That was the, uh, the, the first uh, one. No, no, no. That was the uh, cell tower, I believe. That's where the a uh, lot of late stuff yep. came in. We don't so, tech, not, not not the Pine Barrens it's, folks, well, maybe. but okay. the other the other case. Not this year. And and we had a lot of issues with that case as well because the material that was given to us was stacked and very late uh, the afternoon like this the afternoon and the, the uh, evening of the hearing same day so I'm sorry I interrupted you go no, ahead. I, I'm at the point of I'm not doing this tonight if I may uh, Mr. Chairman uh, you may in a moment I mean you can check with the rest of the board that's what I'm intending to do but if it's that thing over there it's not no, 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 no. What, show me show me what is did you ever did you print it off this was uh, placed in the board file. We have it, Monsieur. Thank you, anyway. I don't get it. I don't get it. So continue with your uh, remarks. My remarks are that I'm asking for 24 hours notice, not the same day, and certainly not six. I don't think that's a lot to ask from professional attorneys. I mean, we, other than Mr. Chairman here, are not attorneys. We need time to read these things. We need time to absorb them. We need time to look them over, compare them to the five other things that we have. And it's just, it's just not fair, and I am not prepared to go forward tonight. Ms. Mello, do you hear, uh, you care to be heard? <laughs> I'll back up. I feel the same way as Ms. Clark because I work a full-time job. When I got this in, I was like, are you kidding me? Mm. I'm not a lawyer. And it took well, me a long uh, time to To be fair to Ms. Sheehan, that's not her no, file. That's not her. No, I, I, but it's part of this hearing. Yes. So I, what I would say is, if they thought it was important enough to have us to submit it, then we should have a chance to look at it. And if they don't care about, about it enough for us to look at it before tonight's hearing, I don't want to see it at all. Oh, done. Well, Not yeah, submitted as part of the case. I consider it already submitted since it's gotten. Yeah, it's in the board file, so it's considered yeah, submitted. I'm with Sharon. Okay. Member Poirier. Well, I guess um, I, I'm a, a bit concerned that if we're making a decision tonight and there's something in there that might bear on this, I, I'm trying to figure out how we do right by um, everybody here if we don't have all of the information in front of us. So I think that I would um, feel the same way that they do, that we should have a chance to look at it and include it as part of our deliberations here. Member Barrington. I agree with what everybody has said. Um, I do have some concern for the other party of delaying this further down the road, you know, whether it's weeks or another month. Um, but, you know, again, I, I, I'd like to be making a decision based upon all the information. Do you feel as if you can make uh, an informed decision or ask informed questions this evening based upon your level of preparation? Well, right now you've got my curiosity as, <laughs> as to what this is and, and whether or not that would be a factor. I have two things before I turn the floor over to you. First, there are three of us on this board that still work full-time jobs. And as I said before, we work very hard to prepare for these cases, all of them, not just this one, but all of them. The uh, two gentlemen to my right are 
uh, retired, but also have busy lives even in retirement. And uh, I can tell everybody in this room, not Attorney Ferguson or Attorney Sheehan who understand this already, but late filings are common in the practice of law. Judges hate that stuff. We don't like it either. So I think I'm getting a consensus here uh, from everybody that they're not comfortable proceeding unless all material has been reviewed and considered in advance. Ms. Sheehan, I have one question for you, and then I'll listen to what you have to say. I'm assuming that Attorney Brewer in representing Save the Pine Barrens, and she does a fine job, um, that the arguments that she's raising are arguments that you would speak to this evening. Is that true? Yes, they're very simple, three points that I'd be happy to explain to you. And I could even summarize the letter for you so that you have full information so that we don't have to continue this any longer. As you know, the hearing was held mm -hmm. first on March 24th, and you asked us to craft three, three or four questions for town council, which we did promptly the very next day. Mm -hmm. We heard nothing from town council in response to that. We, have, we were here last week because we thought the hearing was scheduled according to our notes for May 3rd. And so this was originally filed, as you know, in December. And so here we are, five and a half months later, trying to obtain relief for the residents of this community from this activity. And the council for SLT submitted the 90-page document on Thursday. Yes, it's very long. Ours is a very simple, when you take out the recitation of the facts, which you're very familiar with, three very simple points that I'd be happy to address briefly and answer any questions about. Thank you for that. Uh, Attorney Ferguson, that, uh, that long memo that you filed with us, as Attorney Sheehan said on Thursday, was that uh, copied to uh, Attorney Brewer and or Attorney Sheehan? It was copied to Attorney Brewer as counsel for um, Ms. Sheehan, uh, and it's, if you look below the signature block. I'm okay, right so they had your submission as of last week. They did. And Attorney Sheehan, can you tell me whether Attorney Brewer copied that letter, that late received letter that we're talking about tonight? Did she copy that to Attorney Ferguson? He already said that he did, Mr. Chair. She did. She did. I did receive a copy. Of okay, so just want to be absolutely clear about all of this. So. The ball bounces back to us. Uh, Attorney Sheehan uh, says that this is a simple letter and that uh, she's prepared to um, tailor her remarks based upon, uh, I'm assuming, a lot of what we've already heard. And I want to inquire again, based upon the back and forth from counsel, what the, uh, what the sentiment, sentiment of the board is now. I'm getting the uh, stink eye from the vice chair here. Um, I spent Mother's Day afternoon reading this because it had come in on Thursday and my meeting was Tuesday night. So thank you for that. I did sit next to some flowers, so it was lovely. Um, I'm not budging. Well, we're not talking about Attorney I, Ferguson's I, I'm just, We're talking I'm just about Attorney Ferguson's making a point Brewer's that session. I do my homework when I have it in a timely fashion. Could we, I mean, does it make sense to break for 15 minutes, let us read the notification and see how simple it actually is and whether or not we can digest it for tonight only because these people, as Jim pointed out, are under a timeline. And I, I would hate to delay it for them. Gentlemen? <laughs> Who's under a timeline? Who's under a timeline? I'm not. Who? What do because, you mean by that? Because they have, according to what we heard at the last hearing, they have people who are interested in moving in there in May and June to start the, the process of building, and they cannot do that while this is continuing. So 
So if we put it out another month, they are pushed out another month. If we decide to do this, that is to say push it out, I, it would be a very short continuance. I don't see it being a month. What, what do you think, Ed? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks? Yeah. So Does no one wants to look at it. Earth so we don't get any more sand and dust all over our houses? And well, hold on. I, I'll, I'll take some comments in a moment. Right now we're trying to figure out what to do about this late filing. And um, we want to be fully prepared. So I don't want to keep going over the same point, but uh, the vice chair feels strongly that this should be uh, postponed for a short period. And uh, I, I guess I kind of want to get the sense of the rest of you at this juncture. If it is postponed, I, I would certainly lobby for a very short postponement. We have a meeting on the 21st. Uh, I didn't think we had a meeting on the 21st. Do we have a meeting on the 21st? We do. Yes. Our last ones were continued. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. Th those were the right two that we meeting. just we have a that just asked for continuances. Yep. I wouldn't put it on that night. I think if we do postpone, if, I think everybody who's interested in this case should know that it's the only case on our agenda. So we don't have to go through other matters and keep people here until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Point of information, Mr. Chair? I beg your pardon? Point of information. A point of information. Yes, sir. There are three of those lots that are before the planning board as we speak mm -hmm. that are under agreement, that are being decided as we speak. Um, I think postponing this a couple of weeks is going to just bottle up the whole thing. Yeah, I know there's one lot coming before. Well, let me, let me uh, interrupt you for a moment because I observe that your client is sitting to your left, and he probably better than anybody in this room understands what his time frames are. So why don't you have a word with him, and then you can address us as to whether a postponement of a couple of weeks would be onerous from a financial standpoint. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to the, to the panel. Um, Certainly, Mr. Opachinski is a lot closer to the situation than I am. However, what I understand is that there is a closing presently scheduled for May 22nd, and that this is a 1031 like kind exchange. So as a result, for those who are familiar with the statutory scheme related to those types of transactions, there are very strict time frames in order for those closings to occur. So um, I certainly appreciate um, where the board is coming from with respect to the submissions. I know the board is meticulous, as, as you've stated, about reviewing materials to be prepared. So what we try to do is provide what we were hoping would be a useful packet of information for purposes of this hearing. We tried to do that as soon as we could. Um, no, no intention to <laughs> review it on Mother's Day. That was Day. just the first <laughs> afternoon not. I knew it was for um, So uh, there is a concern, I would say, on behalf of my client that postponing this would create uncertainty with respect to the well, uh, uh, buyer. Let me address that with you for a second. I don't want anybody in this room to think for one second that one more hearing is going to do this. So if we postpone tonight and it goes over a couple of weeks, that closing that you just referred to, more likely than not, is going to have to get pushed off. This is not going to be a one-shot deal based upon my review of all the evidence. There are a host of issues here that we're not going to get into until we decide whether we're going to go forward tonight. But it's, this is a complicated case, and we're going to give it justice, and we're going to give it the attention that it deserves. Without being rushed, this is not a dodge. This is the board doing its due diligence on the part of the people of the town of Carver. So, Mr. Opachinsky, through council, it's going to take a little while, I think, before we come to a decision on the merits here. I don't see, again, I don't see this happening in one more meeting, whether we go forward tonight or not. Mr. Chair, can I take you up on your offer to confer with my client? Yes, of course you can. Is, is yeah, do you want to go out in the hallway? Yeah, that would be great. Thank All right. you very much. So we'll suspend for five minutes. Is that enough time? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.
Simon right up. It's, I'm surprised. Out the door. Yeah. Out the door. The way out. Anyone in the Carver residence here, there are two openings on this board. Anybody who lives out of town, you can't do it. From when Peg left, it's taken us six, seven months to put one on front. Last week. Seven months. Are you picky or are you just a different? No, it was it. You got three openings on front? <sighs> All set. Okay, we're back in session. Have you had a chance to confer with your client adequately, Attorney Ferguson? I have, Mr. Chair. Yes, and tell us what uh, you'd like to have us here. So what we, um, what we propose uh, as a means to address everyone's concerns, I understand that the appellant would like to have the matter heard. Mm -hmm. Certainly I'm cognizant of the panel's position and the desire to review and have a full understanding of the materials. Um, to try to bridge that gap and also address my client's concerns regarding the time frame for closings and um, other issues that are other dominoes that are already sort of in effect and falling, so to speak. Um, what we would propose, if the if the panel is willing, is since we are gathered here tonight to have a discussion of the issues, um, we can. I'm happy to limit them to what we had in our submission and what was included in the March 24th letter. Um, and then schedule a subsequent hearing that could be tailored to whatever issues the panel might still have after tonight's hearing and after the panel has had an opportunity to digest today's submission. So in other words, if you go to court, you argue the, the case of the court, the judge takes it under advisement, and then you know either schedules a follow-up or makes a decision at that point. To the extent that we can address some of the issues and provide clarity, I mean, frankly, if the panel were interested, I do have a presentation that I was intending, if permitted, as a means to distill the packet of materials that we have provided, to walk the panel through the issues and the record evidence. If we did that tonight, that might obviate the need for an extended subsequent hearing. Any further hearing might be targeted either just to the issues that were raised in the letter that we submitted today, um, and, you know, perhaps we might even have a decision by that. But I don't want to be presumptuous about that. I'm, I'm just offering this as a trying to be practical uh, in, a, in a way to address our concerns. Attorney Sheehan, may I hear from you? Certainly, Mr. Chair. We would like this matter resolved as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the request for enforcement was first brought in December. The appeal to this board was filed in January. And the hearing that was open, the public hearing was opened on March 22nd. Yes. At that time, just to review the matter, you asked town, you asked us, the appellants, the petitioners, to frame questions for town council because you were unclear about the law. We promptly did that the next day. We received no response from anyone about that until Thursday when we got the 90-page document. We have heard nothing from town council. This is the second time that people have come out, that your own residents have come out to speak to you during this public hearing about their concerns. So let's, uh, let's address what process. Attorney Ferguson had to say. Are you prepared to go forward tonight without us considering this late submitted letter? No, I'm not. This, as okay. Attorney Brewer said, All right. I am prepared. This is a public hearing. We are prepared to present our testimony both from these residents and our legal arguments. I'm prepared to summarize them, but we would like this matter resolved and to move on. Okay, well, look, we've not had an opportunity to review your own attorney's letter, multi-page letter, in the nature of a brief, single-spaced. So it seems to me that the way out of this is for you either to go forward tonight, the two of you, and you, Attorney Sheehan, to go forward without reference to this letter, which we've not looked at. Or, in the alternative, we could take another suspension, I suppose, if people are comfortable with this, and try to zip through this as quickly as possible so that you would be able to refer to it when it comes time for you to speak tonight. So I ask again for guidance from the board. What, what would you folks prefer to do? 
Do we go forward tonight without any reference to this letter, which we haven't seen? Or well, do we, we suspend for a few minutes, go through this as quickly as we can, and then come back? We won't know if she's referring to it or not, not having seen it. Right. And did you bring enough copies for the whole class? I think that uh, there are copies in what was distributed tonight. I didn't see anything. No. No? It's the no. very last statement oh, okay. of the package. Um. Go ahead, because I'm thinking of going in. If those are our two options, it sounds to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, that we are going to move forward tonight either without referencing this and letting her directly speak to it, or reading this and then moving on. Because we've been here 40 minutes, I know. <laughs> and we haven't started the hearing, right. I would, pre I would prefer to start the hearing without reference, direct reference to this. I'll, I'll go with that. I agree with that. But I will remain peeved. So, so Ms. Sheehan, you heard that. Are you prepared to move forward tonight on behalf of the petitioner without reference to your attorney's letter, which was late filed this afternoon? Um, Mr. Chairman, this is a public hearing. And I believe I would be entitled to make public comments and present our oral arguments. Yes, you are, but you are you are entitled to do that after your attorney files before us with proper notice. And when I learned of this at three o'clock this afternoon, four hours before tonight's hearing, that for me wasn't sufficient time. And the rest of us up here have not reviewed it at all. I haven't either for that matter. So you're absolutely entitled to a public hearing, but we want to be prepared to listen to all arguments, both sides, as expeditiously as possible. So I'm offering you tonight, based on the consensus of this board, an opportunity to move forward, because you've said that's very important to you, and I believe it is, and we want to move forward. But when we keep getting late stuff, it's very hard for us to do due diligence. So I'm going to tell you again, or ask you again, do you want to move forward tonight without reference to your own attorney's letter, which came in very late, or do you prefer a postponement to a, a, a short date within the next couple of weeks, or do you want us to take another suspension tonight so that we can try to get through this and then have uh, time available to uh, recommence this public hearing? Those, uh, for me, I think are the three options in front of you. A, B, or C. Which one do you want? As attorney, for indicated to you this afternoon, we do not want a continuance. We would like to proceed with the public hearing. There are people here. Okay, you've said that already, and I don't want you to repeat yourself. I tend to do that, too. Um, so if you do not want a continuance, a general continuance, a short continuance, then your choices are allowing us to suspend for a period of time tonight to try to get through this letter and understand it and digest it. Or we can start right now, so long as you agree that you're not going to reference this letter, which we have not read or seen. Well, I would prefer that if you would like to take the time to read the letter, that you do so. OK. So you think 15 minutes is enough? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry about this. 15 more minutes is now 20 before 8. We'll come back at 5 before 8. If I may, Mr. Chair, before we go off the record, briefly. So to speak, very briefly, uh, to the extent that the panel was going to suspend, and if the panel were interested in seeing a visual PowerPoint, this would afford me an opportunity to set up, but I leave it to your discretion. No, we're not going to do that. Thank you. All right, so we'll be back uh, in session at 7.55. There will be no deliberation up here. This is just to give us the opportunity to read this letter and try to digest it. Thank you, everybody. One more minute.
Jim, you had enough time. Yeah, I don't think any more time is going to matter. Thank you, sir. <coughs> is that down here? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So let's reconvene after a 15 minute suspension to allow us to review this letter of the petitioner's counsel in the nature of a brief. It's not simple, despite the characterization of uh, Attorney Sheehan but it does speak to issues that have arisen in this case. So we have tried to digest it as quickly as possible with uh, reference to any other materials that we have on hand. And what I'd like to do at this juncture is to ask Attorney Ferguson some questions. Absolutely. And these questions are based upon argument that you made in your submission of last Thursday. The first of these is uh, that I'm going to direct your attention to is on page five of your letter. You need a minute to get that out. And at the top of that letter, you argue that the ZBA does not have the authority to overturn a planning board's unappealed approval of a definitive subdivision plan, which approval is final as a matter of law because there was no appeal. Are you... Um, do you understand that the petition in this case is asking this board to overturn the planning board? Well, respectfully, uh, I think that's effectively what the petitioner or the appellant is Tell me asking. what you mean by effectively. Okay, so at, at tab 7 of the letter, and I have tab copies of this well, piece of the panel. Go ahead. Um, but at awesome. tab 7, you'll see the request for enforcement. It's dated March 16, 2002. And what the appellant or the petitioner is asking for, in this case, is a cease and desist. So what does that mean? A cease and desist from performing operations consistent with the definitive subdivision plan and consistent with the 2018 earth removal permit. Okay, let me stop you there. Yes. Attorney Sheehan, are you asking this board to effectively overturn the planning board's unappealed decision from 2018? And I didn't think she was either. Now, in your memo, and by the way, everybody, the questions that I'm asking are typical attorney-attorney questions, where we're trying to get to the bottom of issues here. So I don't want anybody thinking because of the nature of the questions that I'm asking, that I'm leaning one way or the other, or anybody else up here is either for that matter. So having given that disclaimer, at the beginning of page five, Attorney uh, Ferguson, you indicate that our zoning bylaws grant us the power to hear and decide appeals taken by any person aggrieved by reason of his inability to obtain a permit or enforcement action from any administrative officer, in this case our building commissioner, under the provisions of Chapter 40A, Sections 8 and 15. Do you agree that I'm reading that correctly? Uh, it, it sounds so, yes. So doesn't that suggest to you, Attorney Ferguson, that we do have the power, this board, to direct our building commissioner to enforce the zoning bylaw in this town if the activity which is present, and we haven't determined exactly what that activity is just yet, but if there is activity present um, that is outside the scope of the planning board's decision from 2018. If I understand the chair correctly, I would agree that what the zoning bylaw does is set forth very specific and enumerated powers, including in general the power to hear and decide appeals from persons agreed and <coughs> satisfy that problem. Um, with respect to um, 
an enforcement action or the, abil and the inability to obtain an enforcement action. No. However, if I may. Go ahead, sorry. Nothing in that provision speaks to conduct, underlying conduct, which has already been fully vetted, reviewed, and unanimously approved by one or more other town committees. And that's where I believe that there is an overlap and an issue with respect to the ZBA's jurisdiction, because otherwise it would call into question other statutory schemes such as the subdivision control law, which is intended to provide certainty and finality to abutters, to okay. folks on my client, as well as prospective And, and, and I, I get that. Tonight. I understand that. Thank you. But isn't what the petitioner is suggesting here that the activity of your client has now proceeded to the point where such activity is outside the scope of the four corners of the planning board's decision from 2018 and that being outside its scope, that activity is no longer in compliance with the zoning bylaws. I understand that that is an argument that I believe the petitioner has now made for the first time this afternoon in the letter that the ZBA has just reviewed moments ago. What the petitioner is effectively looking for is an injunction. She's treating the panel as if it were a court, and she's asking the panel to stop the operations due to what she believes to be, and based on uh, what I would demonstrate are incorrect facts, including one demonstrably incorrect fact in her letter of this afternoon. <clears throat> so yes, I agree that she's trying to make that argument. What I don't agree is that uh, it, it is whether or not she's correct or that the ZBA actually has jurisdiction to hear the argument that she's trying to present on inaccurate factual information. So let me ask you this question sure. in, in the same vein. Mm -hmm. Let's assume the scenario that we have in this case. We have a 2018 decision by the planning board mm -hmm. that was uh, pursuant to a definitive subdivision plan that was approved at that time and not appealed. And we know that the planning board issued a decision, which I'm sure you've seen and read at least two or three times. Now, if this board is to have authority over planning board uh, over zoning uh, issues in the town of Carver, to buy your argument, we would have to step aside, even in the face of evidence, that activity that maybe started within the four corners of that planning board decision in 2018 has now gone well outside that scope. Is that what you're suggesting, Attorney Sheehan? Yes. So if that's what you're suggesting, and that activity which is alleged to be outside the scope of the four corners of that 2018 decision, if that activity is not in compliance with our zoning bylaws, is what you're suggesting that we just have to step aside? No, what I'm suggesting is there has to be a prima facie case. And by that, I mean there has to be a showing of some underlying zoning violation. And there has not been any showing of an underlying zoning violation. Okay, well we haven't gotten Nothing. to the facts yet. But and I want to I want to understand these legal arguments. They may seem awfully esoteric to all of you folks and those who are listening, but um, I want to turn the, the discussion over on this point to the rest of the board members to see if they have anything further they'd like to ask about this or any comments they'd like to make. Because if not, I'm prepared to go on. I just keep going. Keep going. The second argument that you raised, Attorney Ferguson. Yes is that the ZBA does not have power to overturn the Earth Removal Committee's issuance of the 2018 Earth Removal Permit. Now that Earth Removal Permit for everybody here tonight was issued shortly after the Planning Board issued its approval of the definitive, was it the other way around? Yes. Okay, but clearly the ERC issued its permit um, anticipating what the planning board would eventually do in this case. It was all sort of 
an understood situation that this was uh, uh, a situation which would require some degree of excavation and earth removal because of the development of the business park out there. So trying not to repeat myself, which, as I said, I have a tendency to do sometimes, as my kids tell me. Um, are we in the same situation here? If we have an earth removal permit that outlines what your client can do, and if the facts support, if the facts support that he's gone beyond the four corners of that earth removal permit, doesn't the ZBA have authority to step in and say, this is in contravention to the zoning bylaws and pursuant to our power under those bylaws, we have the right to make a decision and to direct the building commissioner to take appropriate action. So, again, theoretically. This, theoretically, and, and again, this is an argument that really has not been made before today. And it really illustrates kind of the chicken and the egg type of circular argument that you see when it comes to jurisdiction and alleged zoning violations. So the zoning bylaw says very little, very little about earth removal at all. And in fact, it says nothing about earth removal in the context of commercial operations. The only appearance of earth removal in the zoning bylaw is in the use regulation schedule at the very beginning of the zoning bylaw. And what we know is that in, it, in its infinite wisdom 30 years ago, the town of Carver created a wholly separate, duly elected board known as the Earth Removal Committee with complete and broad and exclusive jurisdiction when it comes to earth removal matters. And I understand that the ZBA in prior cases has declined to weigh in on matters when it comes to earth removal because of the existence of the Earth Removal Committee. And we've cited to that in but our, like, in our But like what I said with the Planning Board argument, and now with the Earth Removal Committee argument, your client has to live within the four corners of those permits. If he steps outside that boundary, doesn't the ZBA have authority to <laughs> rein him in through uh, directing the BC, the building commissioner, to enforce the appropriate zoning bylaws if there's a violation found. So I think the, the way I can answer this most succinctly is a classic lawyer answer. It depends. So let's take, for example, if you bear with me, let's say the earth removal permit gave you hours of operation, okay? And, uh, or better yet, truckloads per day, okay? You can only remove 50 truckloads of earth in a given day. And let's say my clients were regularly removing 75 truckloads per day. Let's call it 51, okay? Now you have a situation where arguably they, they've gone beyond the limitations of the permit and therefore maybe beyond um, what they're permitted to do under zoning bylaws and what have you. In that scenario, maybe the ZBA would have jurisdiction. That's not really, that's not really in actuality what's being argued here. What's being argued here is that my clients can't remove any earth at all from this site. In order to reach that decision, this board would have to overturn the decision of the planning board, which says that SLT can do that, and the decision of the Earth Removal Committee, which says that SLT can do that. So I, I agree, and I know exactly where you're coming from, Mr. Chair, for certain types of violations, yes. However, when the challenge goes to the heart of the very permit and the heart of the operations that are being undertaken, I do not think that the ZBA has power to issue a cease and desist order that would effectively nullify those decisions and those permits. I would also add that um, the petitioner is certainly well aware of, of ways in which you can challenge an earth removal committee decision. There's another statute, it's the certiorari statute, and there is a separate action pending which we have moved to okay. discuss as well. You know, I started with this discussion tonight with you in particular, based upon your own memo. Yes. And the arguments that you make are very, uh, very strong about the inability of this board to do anything with regard to any zoning violations that we're convinced of based upon a preponderance of the evidence when we get there. And to adopt your opinion as presented in this memo 
would basically render this board toothless. If we find that zoning violations are occurring because the applicant or the petitioner has stepped outside the four corners of the permits that he's already been granted by the Earth Removal Committee and the Planning Board. These are very broad, tough arguments to make. If I may, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I would like the board to, to really keep in mind the following. The time that I submitted the letter, what yeah. we had essentially was one page. Okay? This is one page. It's a request for enforcement. It makes very broad allegations of harm, noise, public nuisance, and it asks for a cease and desist. We did not have the letter that was submitted today. Had I had that letter, and, and this is indicative of the petitioner's conduct over the past several years, if I had access to the very specific types of arguments that the appellant is now trying to make in response to our submission, I would have made sure that we were as clear as possible about the position that we're taking. What we're saying is the ZBA, it's the court, not the ZBA, that has the authority to overturn or supplant the planning board's decision. However, if there are specific allegations that on such and such a date, SLT removed X number of truckloads in violation of this permit, fine. I agree, the ZBA has power to hear and decide an enforcement action like that. Let me but stop you right there for a second. Argued. Okay, let me stop you right there for a second. Yes. Ms. Sheehan. That is not at all what we are arguing. Before. I got some questions for you. Okay. okay. Do you believe this board has the authority to instruct the building commissioner to shut down this operation? As Attorney Ferguson suggests, he thinks you're looking for something in the nature of an injunction. Do we have the authority to do that? You most certainly do. It's quite clear under your bylaws that you are the penultimate zoning enforcement body in this town. And under Article One of your own bylaw, you have the legal duty to protect the residents of this community and to, as you know, carry out all of the purposes of the bylaw, protecting them from noise, providing, making sure they have clean air, preventing blight of the environment, providing adequate air and protecting them from silica and dust. You not only have these powers, you have the duty to enforce the bylaw, regardless of what any other body does. So when you suggest to us that we have the duty to protect the town yes. from blight and everything else, yes. You're suggesting that this board has the power to shut down a major commercial operation based on an allegation that there's a zoning violation going on. We have the right to do that, you say. It's quite clear that this is a legal issue as outlined in the letter. It's not a question of whether you have to find by a preponderance of the evidence that they violated truck limits or anything else. It's a clear reading of the zoning bylaw as set forth in the letter that the Spring Street Innovation District does not allow commercial mining and aggregate processing. Okay. So something interesting that you just said, and please, people, I know I'm going on. In no, interrupt no, no, me. No, no. Um, I think you just said something like we we have to do this. We don't even have to take evidence. Is that I, what I you meant to say? I, no, I'm suggesting that the, the, we are making a legal argument that the zoning bylaw is quite clear that the Spring Street Industrial Innovation District does not allow commercial mining and that this is commercial mining. There is a sign in front of SLT that identifies it as a mining site. It has a U.S. federal government mining ID number. Okay, so let me ask you this question. And I'm, I'm really trying hard to avoid getting into the merits. I want to keep this legal and esoterical for now. You're aware that 
Are you? Not, I should, let me phrase the question. Are you not aware that earth removal has a specific definition under our bylaws? I have it right here. Yes. Okay. So, do you acknowledge, Attorney Sheehan, that when you go to the use table and it says no earth removal allowed in the SSID district? Are you aware that earth removal has that, uh, or that uh, phrase earth removal, those words, have a specific meaning? And that if that meaning is satisfied, and there are exceptions to the prohibition of uh, earth removal in the SSID, there are exceptions, and they're listed in that definition. Do you acknowledge that there are exceptions to the N in the use regulation table? Yes. Okay. I want to um, move on to something else, and this is also directed to you, Attorney Sheehan. The issue of standing is an important issue in every case. I think we can all agree on that. Can you explain to this board what your standing is in this case? Because you have filed an application, and the name of the applicant is Save the Pine Barrens. How is Save the Pine Barrens, how does that have standing to bring this case? does not require the participation of individual members in a lawsuit when a membership organization has this kind of organization, associational standing. Okay. Members of State of Pine Barrens are sitting in this room right now. I know that they have criticized us for not having people at the last meeting. Members are here and they are ready and prepared to speak to you about the harm they have suffered. Okay, They're again, I don't want to get into the harm part just yet. I want to plow through these legal issues first. If you do, would you agree with me that if Save the Pine Barrens is found not to have standing in this case, then it's unnecessary to get into the facts? Yes, I, you have the right to make that decision. Obviously, you would you agree with that, though, that if there's no standing, it's not necessary to get into the facts? Yes, it's a jurisdictional issue. However, we should have the right to make an argument about why we have standing, and the people that are in this room should be able to present to the board the uh, facts of what they have experienced from the last four and a half years of the mining and the commercial aggregate sorting and processing and rock crushing that has created noise dust vibration. Okay. So I, I, I think you've been very eloquent about wanting to get us to understand that there are people in this room or others that you're connected with in some fashion that have been affected. But that's not really where I'm going with this. I'm trying to understand how Save the Pine Barrens has standing legally in this case. There are no abutters listed. There are no abutters to abutters listed. So talk to me about that. Again, I will go to the, it's explained right here in our memo. This is the one that we had to take a time out for and get through in 15 minutes? Okay. What page are you reading from, Ms. Sheehan? I'm reading from the next to the last page. That is, uh, these pages are not enumerated, but uh, you're looking at the, uh, the last full paragraph? Yes. The board is aware that Save the Pine Barrens is a nonprofit organization that represents members who share its concern that the rare ecological gem of the Pine Barrens of southeastern Massachusetts should be protected. A membership organization may have associational standing if its members would have standing in their own right. The interests to be protected are germane to the organization's purpose, and the relief sought does not require the participation of indi individual members in the lawsuit, citing the page I just announced. Okay. Among Save the Pine Barrens members are several residents who live directly across from the SLP construction site. 
Some of your letters to the SSIB have sued over the latest earth removal permit issued to SLT. Attached is the affidavit of one of those letters, Dorothy Pollock, who describes the harm caused by SLT's operations. Should the CBA permit neighborhood residents to speak at the hearing, we will hear from those residents the severe damage caused to their quality of life, their property, and their environs by SLT's work. The resident's agreement is long-standing, serious, and worthy of the board's protection. Attorney Ferguson, how do you want to respond to the issue of standing in this case? Again, the application is filed only in the name of Save the Pine Barrens. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, obviously our position is that there is no standing. That standing... Um, and tell us why, in your opinion, there's no standing. Sure. Um, really, a, a couple of reasons. Um, the case that Attorney Sheehan has uh, decided um, talks about how uh, an entity, a corporate entity, may have standing. May have standing. Not that it does. Not that it does, but may. And so, really what we see in the case law is that the issue of standing is a highly fact-dependent inquiry. And I think the panel is right to pick up on the notion of a butters and a butters to a butters. Under Chapter 40A, there is a notion of a, a presumption of standing that can be rebutted if, if the person bringing the challenge directly abuts or is an abutter to an abutter. That's not what we have here, as far as I'm aware. Um, but in any event, it is a, an extremely fact-intensive inquiry in which even if we to, to take this case citation at face value, there has to be a demonstration that the members of the association have standing in their own right. What does that mean? It means the panel has to examine, or a court for that matter, would have to examine whether or not the individual members constitute a person aggrieved within the meaning of the zoning bylaw. Person aggrieved has a very specific meaning under zoning law, under Chapter 40A. And it talks about individualized or particularized harm to a legally cognizable protected interest that is different, is different in substance from that which the general public could also share. We know that there is no individualized harm here because it's admitted as much in the request for enforcement. These operations have caused and continue to cause excessive noise, dust, vibration, traffic, and constitute a public nuisance. This is the petitioner's words as counsel for a corporation bringing this challenge. It's a public nuisance. What the petitioner is admitting there tacitly, okay, there is no individualized, legally cognizable, protected interest when it comes to the underlying members who would have to have standing in their own right. These are Attorney Sheehan's words, and it's taken directly from Donna Brewer's letter. That isn't the case here. We've got noise, dust, vibration. It's not like someone has come to the ZBA and said, hey, look, I've got a deed and there's a restrictive covenant in the deed and it protects my right to a vista or a view or maybe my right to access light or some other pretty clearly defined legally protected interest that's different from you know, Joe Carver resident who lives on the other side of town. The allegations here are so general that they do not give rise to standing. So even if we assume for the sake of argument that an association, a corporation could come in and say, hey, we have an interest in protecting the, the Pine Barren, so therefore we have standing. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. You have to look to the individual folks involved. Who is actually harmed? What is that harm? What is the nature of that harm? Is it different from the harm that someone else might suffer 2,000 feet down the road? There are lots of intricate issues that go into the issue of standing. I started by saying it's a fact-intensive inquiry, and I'll end with that. I hope that answers or sheds some light on our position, which overall is that there has been absolutely no demonstration, no demonstration of the type of particularized harm required to confer standing as a legal matter. It's admitted as much in the request for enforcement. Public nuisance. Public nuisance. Attorney Sheehan, I know you're well versed in Massachusetts zoning law. Um, I'm sure you understand that with standing, 
You must show that there is a party or parties aggrieved. You must demonstrate that there is individualized harm. And you must demonstrate that the harm is different um, for these people than it is for all the rest of the community. If we were to take your argument to its logical extreme, that there is standing here, if we would take that to its logical extreme, aren't you basically trying to tell this board that someone from Idaho could file a complaint like this or an application like this asking for relief and claiming that they had standing? No. Why not? It does, isn't that your argument to its logical extension? No, not at all. How so? Because as we asserted, and this is a quasi-judicial proceeding, you are here to take evidence and to hear from people who have suffered individualized aggrievement. And I'm not alleging harm on behalf of someone on the other side of town or someone in Idaho. Save the Pine Barrens, as I mentioned and as described in the letter, have members who suffer particularized harm and who have legal standing. And if this board were to find that these individual people living within feet of this operation, whose homes shake, who have dust on their cars as shown by this photograph, do not have legal standing, then I would ask you, who does? Attorney Ferguson, how do you respond to that? You know, this, uh, this hearing tonight is a, is a foreshadowing of a hearing that's going to take place in the Plymouth County Superior Court on May 24, 2022. In that case, there are some Carver residents, um, represented by Ms. Sheehan and Ms. Brewer, have brought a lawsuit against SLT Construction, as well as another individual trust uh, with respect to an adjacent parcel. This is a challenge to a subsequent earth removal, commit, uh, earth removal um, permit. We've moved to dismiss in that case for lack of standing as well on the same allegations. In fact, the affidavit that Ms. Sheehan referenced, which is appended to her submission, is an affidavit that was submitted in that case. This is under review by the court. We're making the same arguments there as we are here. In a certiorari action, which is the action currently pending before the court, the court cannot review if there are alternative forms of relief. The allegations here, maybe they give rise to a private right of action against SLT. Hey, you know, you caused dust to migrate onto my property and uh, it's landed on my windshield. I question whether or not that can't just be remedied by a car wash, frankly. But if there were a, if there were harm such as that, uh, 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 sh 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 if there were harm such as that, it might give rise to a private cause of action for damages against SLT. I do not see how that would give rise to standing to challenge a duly approved earth removal um, committee permit or a duly uh, approved subdivision plan. And that's where we have this intersection, this sort of generalized speculative notions of harm, many of which I would add are unfounded, including the notion that there's going to be silica or... or no, we're not going to get into that. Understood, understood. But, you have to have a particularized harm. You don't have that here. So when Ms. Sheehan says, well, geez, if you don't have standing um, with the example that we provided, when do you have standing? I believe we provided and, and discussed a few examples. If you're you know, a direct butter with a legally cognizable protected interest. Uh, I use the example of a restrictive covenant because for me, that's very clear. I think of the state house downtown Boston. You can't have buildings in front of the state house, the old state house, he says. On, on the corner of state and Congress. You can't have buildings that block the water view because there is a specific right with respect to the state house. The same, the John Hancock building and the Trinity Church right next to it. When they built the John Hancock building, they had the reflected glass. It was a real issue as to whether or not they could build it because the church was saying, hey, you're impacting the lights that's going to come through the stained glass windows. That was a very particularized property specific right. I haven't seen anything like that here. Nothing. Okay. If I, if I you may. Chair, yes, Attorney Sheehan. Um, that case is, that's what, what you said is completely <clears throat> irrelevant to this case. That case involves a different piece of property. As you may know, the Earth Removal Committee authorized the expansion of this project onto another piece of property. 
that was the subject of an earth removal permit, and there's a different standing criteria and standing issue there than there is in this case. Okay. Your point's well taken. Mr. Chair. A final word. On that point? On this point. If, on the standing point. If, if the petitioner's position is that it's irrelevant what's going on in that other lawsuit, then I would suggest that the affidavit that she submitted in her letter today be stricken from the record and not considered by the board because she herself has now admitted that it is not relevant. To I'm not going to do that. Understood, but for the record. Thank you. I want to move off of standing for a minute. I want you, Attorney Ferguson, to tell me if your client is still proceeding with work at the subject property. My understanding is that my client is. Well, then he has a problem. Because if that work is being conducted within the four corners of the planning board decision, and it's not finished after three years, he's going to have to talk to the planning board. So I'm glad you raised that, Mr. Chair, because earlier I referenced the factual inaccuracy, which is demonstrably false, in the letter received this afternoon. And I would refer to you. This is uh, the letter from? Uh, um, Attorney Brewer. Yes. On page three of the letter, the middle paragraph begins with the planning board. Okay. I see it. All right. Um, towards the end of that paragraph, there's a reference to SLT's failure to meet a deadline. You see that? I do. This is a reference to the duly approved definitive subdivision plan. When the panel has an opportunity and looks at the statutory scheme, what the panel will find is that three-year period runs from the date of the endorsement of the plan. As a result, I would then refer to the panel to tab four of our submission where you will find the definitive subdivision plan, July 25th, 2019. that the work that is currently taking place outside of a duly approved subdivision plan is demonstrably false. It's right here in the packet that we submitted. Okay, so let me ask you this. Is your client going to be done as of July, what was it, 19? Uh, I, I should have finished what I, my, my little recitation by saying that my client has submitted a request to the planning board in accordance with the applicable rules and requirements. So there is a request pending <coughs> for an extension. And how long ago was that filed? I believe it was filed today. And, and it, was, um, and it, was, it was mailed today. Mailed okay. today. Mailed today. I would add that the only thing that's required is that the request be made prior to the expiration. So this is not a situation where the request was made on the same day as a hearing, like what we had this afternoon. This and, is months uh, before. Do you expiration. expect that the planning board is going to put that matter on its agenda? I, I, I would be speculating myself. It's only 60 know. days away. Mm -hmm. And because uh, Attorney Sheehan and her group uh, and also through Council Attorney Brewer have raised a number of questions about this operation. It may be that you're not going to get a, um, an extension within that 60 days that's left to you. I, I, I can't speak to that. Um, I, an, I don't know. I think it's it an issue that I want to flag for you both. Certainly appreciate that. Uh, board members have been going on again for quite a while. <laughs> Anybody want to say anything? I, I'm still somewhat disturbed by the standing argument that we had before. It couldn't have been that difficult to get the names of a couple of abutters and put them on the application. Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> There's no legal requirement to do that. As far as standing goes, it would have buttoned it right up. Well, I'm buttoning, buttoning it up right now with no, you're the members not. who are here. No, they're, they're, you have members. I mean, the Save the Pine Parents, I assume, has members in Kingston and Plumpton and right. Plymouth and right. some in Carver. And, but not all your members have standing. Does that just say that some of your members have standing? And why, why couldn't they have been... The petitioners, and you could because, have represented them. Because the why, law, why do you have to make it hard? I'm not making it hard. Yeah, the law is very clear. An organization may bring a legal challenge in order to protect the members, the interests of its members. All it has to have is one member who is harmed. 
by the operation. One member who is here, two members are here, who are direct abutters and who have been harmed by this. You might not like it, but that is what the law I, says I don't. in Massachusetts. And, and in the past, I can think of three occasions and possibly a fourth one coming up where the wrong person applied for the petition and we sent them right back to the building department and told them to start over. Well, the wrong person did not apply for the petition here. Or nonprofit organizations, corporations have the right to seek enforcement to protect the interests of their members. And that is what we did. Yeah. Um, I will say for the record that it has come to my attention that after the make peace matter was appealed, you added parties. And so there must have been some level of concern when that case went up and before a responsive pleading was filed by Makepeace. There must have been some concern on the part of Save the Pine Barrens that the issue of standing, as Ms. Clark just said, needed to be buttoned up legally. Now I'm not going to get into the reason why you decided to add parties, but this goes to the concern that she just expressed and the uh, discussion that you and I had together about standing. Uh, I'm not sure you really need to respond to that. You've made your point clear, but I think I'm hearing Ms. Clark say that she's, uh, she has some concerns about the standing issue. Does anybody want to speak about anything else that's been um, discussed? I mean, Mr. I'm Barrington? Not, I'm sorry, you go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I mean, I'm not concerned about the reapplication to the extension to the planning board because that's not under our jurisdiction. Um, I mean, they have 60 days to get on the um, agenda, and that, that should be fine. So I'm not actually considering that part of it. Okay, now, Mr. Barrington. Do you have anything you want to add at this point? No. Mr. Poirier. I'm good. Ms. Mill. Do you want our opinions about standing based uh, you, on what has come out? Far be it from me to uh, <laughs> try to control what That's you say. That's why we're grouped over here. <laughs> okay. I believe that if there are abutters who are members of Save the Pine Barrens and they want to speak on this, they should have the right to do it. Oh, I have every intention of opening the floor to the public. And I also believe but that that's a different are, issue they, than no, that they would become a member of standing because, because their organization filed this on their behalf. That's the way, that's kind of what I read in, and again, in here, with tonight's brief that we looked at, and also what was sent to us from legal. That's my belief. Thank you. Uh, any further comments from you folks? Hmm? I'm all set. Ms. Clark, you uh, have anything in rejoinder? No, I, I remain believing that they, as an organization, do not have standing, so based upon application of based upon, so uh, zoning common. law yeah, um, that's specific to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yep. Attorney Ferguson, your final comments. On standing? On what we've discussed mm -hmm. tonight. Mm -hmm. Anything new that you feel that we've glossed, that we haven't covered or anything that's been glossed over? No. Well, I mean, obviously, we haven't gotten to the merits, so we've only talked right. about... we're not going to get to the merits. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I would add that um, you know, I, I tend to speak with, with some zeal sometimes, um, and uh, this is obviously a very important issue for, for my clients, whom I represent. And um, one of the real concerning aspects of all of this is the time that has gone by, that the level of effort, expense, agreements with third parties um, that have been made in reliance on what we understood at all times to be duly approved actions of town committees. I 
spent some time on a board in, in my own town. I'm fully cognizant of the level of commitment that's required. And it wasn't the Zoning Board of Appeals in my town, mind you. Um, I'm very sensitive and, and frankly very much appreciative of the time and attention that the panel has given to all of the issues. So I have a suggestion for you. And I know uh, Ms. Sheehan has heard me say something like this before. But one thing that I certainly can agree with, and I think everybody else who's part of this issue, is that these are important allegations that are causing great concern amongst certain members of the community. We also understand that time is passing and that we're not going to finish this case tonight. We're not going to get to the merits tonight. I think we needed a full outing of the legal issues first. It's already getting towards 9 o'clock. If we were to begin a discussion of the merits tonight, we probably wouldn't finish unless we were wanted to go to bed at midnight. So I have a suggestion for you, since I've just indicated that we're going to have to have another day. And we can do a short, short continuance. I think it would be advisable for your client, Attorney Ferguson, to attempt a meeting with Attorney Brewer on behalf of Save the Pine Parents to explore the possibility of um, reaching some sort of meeting of the minds concerning the, uh, the issues that have been raised tonight. You know what those are. You know what it is these people are going to be saying. And these are legitimate concerns. They're not sitting here because they want to. The Bruins are on tonight. And they're losing, yes. Um, but I would like for you and your client to work in good faith with Attorney Sheehan, who's heard me say stuff like this before. Attorney Sheehan obviously is a zealous advocate for her organization, and that organization has a certain following in town. Good for her and good for them. Okay? But Attorney Sheehan, I want to look you in the eye and ask you if you'd be willing to have a meeting with Attorney Ferguson to discuss the possibility of ameliorating some of these effects that Save the Pine Barrens feels its members are experiencing. Or is your position cut and dry that you want a total shutdown of these operations? Because if that's the direction you're going, we're going to have to make a decision. But I think I'm hearing some flexibility, at least in some of the words that have come out of Attorney Ferguson's mouth tonight. So are you prepared to do that? We are certainly prepared to have discussions, but we are not prepared to further delay and continue this hearing. It's going to happen. So let's move past that. Well, okay? That it's going to happen. That our objection. Okay. And your objection is duly noted. We've been going on now since uh, uh, almost two hours, and we haven't even got to the merits yet because we had all these other legal issues to get through, and a late filed memo to boot. So I don't want to go back over ground that we've already covered tonight. This is going to have to be continued, and it'll be a short continuance, as I've said about three or four times. But we've made, I think, good progress understanding the legal positions of both of you. So my question reverts to you again. Would you be prepared in the interim to have a productive conversation with Attorney Ferguson to see if there's some meeting of the minds or some understanding that you can reach on behalf of your membership that would ameliorate some of these conditions that they say that they suffer from every day? Well, again, we've been waiting since January. We're not going to go down this road again. You're and repeating the yourself. And been continued since March 22nd. You're going to get a short continuance tonight because we're not going to go until 11 or 12 o'clock. We're not doing it. 
part of that is your own fault because of this late filing that we had to take a time out for, and which I will probably review again because we had to zip through it quickly. And I'm also going to think very seriously about the, um, the arguments made by Attorney Ferguson at the beginning of his memo and also the discussions about standing tonight. And I may do some legal research as well based upon the case that you bring up or Attorney Brewer brought up. So again, I ask you for the third time, are you prepared to have a meeting with Attorney Ferguson to discuss ways in which his client may be able to ameliorate some of the concerns, if not most of the concerns, of your membership? Yes or no? I will have to check with my membership and whether they would like to invest the time in um, coming up with what might be acceptable to them. That's again, a big time investment for people. I'll have to check with John or Brewer as well. Attorney Ferguson, you only have one person to check with who's sitting to your left. Are you prepared to have that meeting? I don't think I need to check with them because the chair's suggestion is a good one. We've already made that suggestion, and our understanding was that it was basically a yes or no proposition, that you either shut down operations uh, or, or we go forward. Well, so I don't we, we are certainly open to exploring. Okay, so that's the, answer I, that's the answer I wanted to get. But I don't think Attorney Sheehan... Is, and, and I would want to speak with Attorney Brewer, not necessarily directly with Attorney Sheehan for ethical Yeah, purposes. but for, for tonight, since Attorney Brewer's not here, I think I'm hearing Attorney Sheehan say she needs to check with her membership. She's not saying yes or no. We're yes. Okay. We'll have the discussion. Okay. Fair enough. Mr. Chair. Point hold on. Uh, yeah, hold on I just a second. I'll, 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 take you, I'll take you in a minute, I promise. Um, are there any other uh, comments from the board up here tonight? Okay, now we're ready for you. Can you identify yourself? Dorothy Pollitt, a butter to the SLT. Okay, project. and you're the one that signed the uh, affidavit in support of the uh, late filed memo. Is that true? Yes, and I am also a Safe Blind Barons member. Okay. Um, first of all, having these two attorneys meet each other, trying to negotiate the situation, um, I have been active in this project since 2017. I have called Peter Opachinski's office, left messages begging for him to call me back. I have called Earth Removal Committee several times, asking them to water down the sand because it just completely blows directly to my house. Have you gotten any response? No. Um, Earth Removal Committee, um, the first guy, Gary, called me back one time and said, SLT's truck is broken, he's going to do it next week. And Gary said, I told them no, they got to do it today. Um, they did do it that day. They've not been watering down the site with okay. all of this wind and dry lately. Spring Street is covered with sand. They promised to keep and gravel, and they promised to keep it clean. Um, so as far as the lawyers meeting together to negotiate, I've been begging for some kind of relief for three years now. I have received none. Okay. And your point is well taken. And I know the nice lady to your yes. left is in agreement with you. Yeah. Um, let me say this. We are not the ERC. Understood, sir. We are an independent, quasi-judicial board with fairly significant authority, not as circumscribed, in my judgment, as Attorney Ferguson would have us believe. Now, having said that, and that's just this person's opinion, I'm hoping that by encouraging the two contesting parties who are present in this room tonight, that they will make every effort to have a productive conversation. Not an all or none conversation, because in order to achieve a meeting of the minds, you have to give up something in order to get something, right? It's all in the nature of negotiation. We do this every day. If you have a black and white view of what you want in a case, or what you don't want to do in a case, then it's not going to settle. And guess what? 
we will make the decision. And somebody in this room, on one side of the issue or the other, is going to leave very unhappy. So I urge you, Attorney Sheehan through Attorney Brewer and Attorney Ferguson, to make every effort to try to address concerns which have been raised, and you know what they are, as does your client. Talk with Attorney Brewer, who strikes me as a very reasonable personality. I hope she feels better soon. And talk with Attorney Sheehan, who lives and breathes this stuff every day. And I don't mean the dust. I'm sorry, ladies. I'm talking about <laughs> this cause. Mr. Chair, and this you... cause is an admirable cause. But we are constrained by the law at this level. We will follow the law wherever it takes us. And if you folks can't reach an accord, we will impose a decision, as I said a moment ago, that somebody is not going to be very happy with, which is going to just lead to spiraling litigation and something that you don't want, which is more delay. If you're serious about that, and I believe you are to my core, that you don't want any more delay, then I think you really need to have these conversations. Because if we can't get to that meeting of the minds, it's not going to be a matter of weeks when it's appealed. Tell us, Attorney Ferguson, being the litigator that you are, how long a case like this is going to take to get through the courts. Oh, it, it, it can take sometimes years. And what I would say to the panel is I have availability this week. I'm happy to talk tomorrow, although I have a deposition. I will step out of the deposition. I'm happy to talk on Thursday. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take more than a stepping out of the deposition. I'm, I'm just suggesting that I will make myself available despite the fact that there are other things going on. And I, I can tell everybody add. here tonight and those who are watching, I've been litigating cases for many years. And when Attorney Ferguson says that it could take years, and I know Attorney Sheehan agrees with this too because she's in the middle of these kinds of cases, that's just at the superior court level. Then if you're unhappy with that, you have a right to appeal to the appeals court. So this is not going to be one year, maybe three or four. So everybody needs to think about living under these conditions. If these folks can't get together, living under these conditions for the next few years while this case goes up. So locally the buck stops here, but it doesn't mean that this case dies here. These are hard words to say because as an attorney, I don't like the fact that the courts are so log jammed and so backed up and COVID made it worse. You know what they say, justice delayed is justice denied. Just in, justice denied. Anybody else? Mr. One more, Ms. Pollitt. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I'm under the understanding that the zoning board is um, has the right and needs to make sure that the town zoning rules are adhered to. And this appears um, by all means to be a sand mining situation. If it were to be a high-end business park, there would not be a tin building with Spring Street access on the front. It would be a beautifully landscaped um, front entrance way to a business park. They're strip mining this land as you can see when you drive down 44, but isn't there a, a zoning bylaw that says that you only take out the earth that's necessary? Why is this place completely leveled like <laughs> South Boston? Every single tree every inch of property that he owns. Even the existing natural trees that were at the level that he is strip mining 
were taken down. Everything was taken okay. down. It's like and, a desert. And, and, and there's it, no barrier you, you, between him. There's a huge red, uh, water container, septic pole, 100 year rain thing, catch basin, 50 feet from a vernal pool with no trees protecting it. Mm. You're getting into the merits, which we've decided already. If we start to go down that road, Ms. Pollitt, with respect, we're going to be here at least another hour, maybe two, because we'll be back and forth amongst the audience and also between the attorneys. And I expect that will happen if an agreement cannot be reached. Okay? So it'll be a wide-ranging discussion the next time, if necessary. Ms. Miller, I think I heard you murmuring. No, Sharon says she hasn't had supper yet. <laughs> I have to tell you, she gets prickly when she hasn't had supper. I came in prickly. Um, does anyone else feel like they really need to be heard tonight? I don't want to drown out voices here, if I can help it. I, I just want to say the stuff that's going on. I live right on High Street, 170. And uh, we just opened our pool two weeks ago. Mm. Every day we get up in the morning and our steers have a little layer of sand down on our steps. I just put in a brand new line of last year in a 20 by 40 in ground pool. So I hope to God that the sand doesn't ruin it. Well, I, I believe that both of you have spoken eloquently about your concerns. And I know that most everybody else here tonight has the same concerns. And I know that Attorney Ferguson, who's a very intelligent and well-spoken attorney, is hearing these concerns as well on behalf of his client. If we're going to get past um, these concerns without further litigation and the delay of which I just spoke, you guys need to do something. Because you're going down a road right now which is you're going faster and faster down that litigation road. That's not where you want to be if you're concerned about time and amelioration. You don't want to be on that road. I tell my own clients this. If you can reach a reasonable accord, I tell them, don't hold out for the whole enchilada. Don't. You're going to be spending a ton of money and wasting a lot of time and in the end, you may lose. Because he has legitimate legal arguments. Just as Attorney Brewer and Attorney Sheehan have legitimate legal arguments. Somebody is going to walk away unhappy, as I said before, if some kind of accord or understanding is not reached. You could even do something along the lines of saying, OK, we'll give. Uh, somebody 90 days in a construction case, not saying this one necessarily, but let's say in a, in a construction case, to ameliorate safety concerns. And at the end of 90 days, if those concerns have not been addressed, you go back to court or you go back to the committee or board that suggested such a, such a possible uh, accord in the first place. So. There are different measures here, and Attorney Sheehan, Attorney Brewer, Attorney Ferguson all understand what they are. But I'm speaking to everybody now who has a concern about this. This is a very tough road to take. And there are serious legal issues on both sides. As I said at the beginning, remember? Don't assume that I'm feeling or leaning one way or the other because of my questions. I think I gave both of you a hard time. So, having said that, I think we now need to discuss uh, a continuance date. We'll see what you folks come back with, and uh, I'm going to take you in a second. I'm sorry, I'm not ignoring you. Um, if it looks like you need more time to have discussion, because this is going to be a relatively short date that we're going to give you in a moment. If you need more time to work something out, by all means, reach out to uh, our clerk in the planning department who's sitting here in the front row on the end to my right. And she will find a way to notify me. 
and by virtue of the authority given to me by this board, I can entertain administrative continuances. So we can talk about that, grant continuances, if it's appropriate, so that people don't have to come back and inconvenience themselves if talks are ongoing. What's your name? Mike Ficini. Hi, Mike. I own a, a company called Bridgestone Development, and uh, I've purchased a lot on um, Spring Street, which is Lot 1A. It's really not in the subdivision, but it's the very front lot. Is that one of the lots in this case? It, I don't know how it shows on the plan. It, it was part of one of the properties. Okay. Yeah. So Fine. it's the very front lot on yes, sir. Spring Street. I've already spent close to a million dollars on a building that's arriving in four weeks. I have a building permit from the town. Uh, I have committed to Peter to buy <coughs> five other lots in the subdivision. I've spent probably forty or fifty thousand dollars on engineering on those lots. Hey, I got to get to know you better. S some of those uh, applications and stuff were already been submitted to the town. So I'm wondering. This building's supposed to show up in four weeks. Where does that put me, and, and what kind of a position am I in? I think you need to uh, hopefully communicate your concerns, as you just have, uh, again in private to Mr. Opachinski mm -hmm. and or his attorney. Mm -hmm. I think both sides have good reason to try to get together on this. I really do. Time for you folks and amelioration of conditions that you say are really noxious. And by the same token, you want to continue your project and you want to start to develop. You have an agreement to sell to him. We don't have an agreement to sell. I have an agreement. I've already purchased the lot. Okay, but and you're in the process of wanting to develop. Right. In your but, permitting. But I have, as I'm saying to you, I already have about a million dollars spent mm. already in a building that's been on a water for a year but mm -hmm. it's now showing up. So, everybody hearing this? Yeah. Ms. Sheehan, you hearing this? Mm -hmm. Mike, could you, could you comment on the, the landscaping and everything that you're concerned about? I, I, I've done a lot of uh, work on the South Shore. I'm currently doing very high-end homes in Sandwich, two, two, three million dollar homes was one of the builders of Atlanta Country Club in, in Plymouth and back in the early 90s. Uh, I do everything that I do is very high end and very well done. I just finished 121 condos in Hanson, Massachusetts. and I do a nice job with everything that I do. So my, my thought was, is I've known Peter for a long time. His, he and I kind of aligned with the way we like to do things, and I think he was happy that I committed to some of the lots because he knows that I'm going to finish them and do them right. So okay. I guess that's what you're asking, right? Thank you. Is this lot part of what we're arguing? I'm not sure. It is. It's on this 1A. 1A? Yep. It's on the bond. On the what? It's on me. It actually doesn't Family. have access through the park. It has access off the Spring Street. This is for mail. Yeah. We see it. It's on the application. Thank you. Um, does anyone else feel that they want to be heard tonight? Something that, that they feel is compelling enough that we should listen to it for a couple of minutes? Again, I'm trying to keep from straying too much into the merits here. I just want to say one thing. I've heard money, 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 but money shouldn't matter. This is the town. What, what's Washington. your name? My name is Dan Farini. Hello, Dan. I represent, excuse me, I represent Cava Concerned Citizens. Um, I'm hearing citizens. money, money, money. This should not, money should not affect the board's decision or what goes on tonight. It should go by the town bylaws, and that's what we're asking. I think everybody here is asking the same thing that we follow the time um, bylaws. And I'm sorry, but people spend money every time, but that should not affect this board or anybody in this room's decision going forward. Okay. I guess the only thing I would say is the only reason I made that decision to spend that money was because I had an approved subdivision plan and I had a, a permit from the town stating that it was okay. Otherwise, I never would have done that. So well, and I understand that he doesn't feel 
that money is a problem, but it's not his million dollars, it's mine. Right, and he is Mr. Farini. Yes. And I've heard other people in here mention money all night long, and in the last meeting we heard money, and it shouldn't, again, should not make a decision on this town how we move forward. He's not asking. That I'm not asking. I'm Wait a minute, let's, let's uh, hold, hold on, hold on. Hold on. No back and forth. Uh, uh, Mr. Farini, your point is well heard, and thank you for that. Thank you for listening tonight. Ma'am? Oh, no, I'm just trying to clarify the record because I, too, am part owner of that lot. And okay, and what's your name? Mary Ellen Williams. Hello, Mary Ellen. How are you? I'm a resident of the town of Powell. I have been for 55 years. I don't You're not that old. Oh, I am. <laughs> but I don't understand how this is all coming into play with all of these members of a corporate entity opposing something in Carver when some of these people don't even reside in the town. Mm, that's the standing home. issue that we discussed tonight. I'm, I'm sure you listened uh, oh, with great interest to that. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Like a corporation. No, hold on. Talk to us. Yeah, just talk to us. She's getting really prickly because she hasn't had anything to eat. And I'll, I, see, we're, we're all already starting to get into things that I think are better spoken of at the next meeting, assuming there isn't a meeting of the minds. Did you want to say something? No. Okay. And briefly, uh, um, your name? Why are, why, your Joey name? Lee, Street. Thank you. Um, why are all these contractors coming here and not another town that's cheaper? <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I guess he, I guess he thinks he can make money. I don't know. Based in Carver, man. Direct to the chair, please. Obey the rules. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think we've heard enough from everybody tonight. Um, you got a date? Concerns about conditions on the one hand, business concerns on the other. Start talking. Please. Start Mr. Chairman, talking. can you set a date, please? Yes. So we with... We're going to set a date. Today is what, the 10th? 10th. What looks good for people two to three weeks out? Is that going to give you enough time to get together on this, do you think, two to three weeks? We, we have to maintain our position for the record, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, unfortunately, for my client's interest, uh, Rather than later, okay. we do have the closing. I think we and I think Ms. Sheehan would agree with that yeah. sooner yeah. rather than later. Yes. All right, so there's I, something I, I you just, agree on. You're halfway there. I, I, I just want to make sure for the record, again, we're, we're cognizant of the panel's concerns, but we are faced with deadlines. Okay. So two to three weeks out would be difficult to know. Well, it's not going to be this week. It's not going to be next week either. Yeah, the, week after. Week. the week after, I think it is. Or the 23rd. Where are we? The 23rd is a Monday. Yeah. That's a holiday, isn't it? No, What's the 30th the is the holiday. What about the 23rd? On a Monday? Yes. I'm fine with that. Ms. Clark. I can do that. I didn't hear you. I can do that. <laughs> Mr. Poirier. Uh, actually, no. Okay. I won't be back then. I won't be back until the and 24th. Where else? So the 24th, is that good for you? 24th is fine. Is Clark good? 24th is no good. Okay. Uh, how about the 25th? It's a Wednesday? Yes. Good. I have no light. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we had your answer. Ms. Clark? Uh, 25th is no good. <laughs> what about the 26th? 26th is good. Ms. Mello? Get in there early. It's a Thursday, the 26th. Yes, I have a CPC meeting, but I will skip it. Mr. Poirier, yes, the 26th. That works. Mr. Barrington, the 26th. After the 7th. Mm -hmm. Attorney Thursday, Ferguson, Thursday, the 26th. Thursday, the 26th. Yeah. He's good, too. It's the earliest we can get together. Seven. We're trying to do our best here. I understand. Ms. Sheehan, the 26th. Yes, Mr. Chair. You guys got to talk. Mr. Chairman. Twenty-sixth. I know, uh, Attorney Ferguson, you have an unhappy face. I'm not sure that there's anything that, that... It's a Thursday. 
can, can be done. I, I've tried to at least make clear that there are third party commitments that are effectively being interfered with. You're going to have to get on the phone tomorrow. I, we've, we've made our position clear in that we are willing to talk. It takes two to tango. And unfortunately, what I fear is that this is part of the overall effort to. What I thought I heard. I, you know, most respectfully, and I've enjoyed listening to you both tonight. Um, I don't believe that Ms. Sheehan, Attorney Sheehan, is trying to delay anything. Maybe not. I, I thought I heard, or I thought I heard rumblings of a court action, regardless of what happens well, at this hearing. And, and we haven't heard any of that, and if there is uh, such activity going on, it's beyond our control anyway. I, I wonder if before we. I guess closed tonight, if I can have a moment with my client, because one thing the parties might be able to discuss is a, an agreement subject to a reservation of rights with respect to a decision of the ZBA, so that rather than putting the task in the hands of the panel, parties just go to court. But that's something I would need to speak with my client about. If there truly is no interest in delay, whether it's an up or down decision, it's a stipulation to defer the matter to the court. I think you need to talk to Attorney Sheehan. I think you do her a disservice by not at least uh, arranging a meeting. I'm, not, I'm happy, to talk. happy to talk. Yeah, but it's got to be an open-ended um, conversation where both parties are diligently and sincerely trying to reach an accord to address delay concerns, address ongoing litigation concerns, to address conditions that you've heard about tonight. There's a lot on the table, isn't there, Attorney Sheehan? Yes, Mr. Chair. There's a lot to think about. And from um, what I've heard tonight from Attorney Ferguson, and I'm a pretty good judge of character, I think he is an open-minded person and an honest person. Obviously, he's subject to the constraints that his client puts on him, but I think he has his client's ear. And I know your folks have your ear as well. Let's all be friendly. Okay? And I know there's a high level of frustration here because you've heard this before, right? Or you've tried to get responses before. This isn't the planning board. This isn't the conservation commission. This isn't the Earth Removal Committee. This board is different. We are an appellate board, quasi-judicial, five judges without the robes. We will follow the law wherever it takes us. And if it takes us in the direction that your client doesn't like, or if it takes us in the direction that your client doesn't like, a client's, your association, so be it. We can all sleep at night because we follow the law. We don't pay, uh, play favorites. There's no, we scratch your back and you scratch ours, which has happened before in times past in this town. That's not this board. So, enough, yeah. enough. So we have the date of May 26th. I'll try to get the room upstairs. It's a little stuffy down here, isn't it? What time is that? 7 p.m. 7 p.m. And by the way, it's going to be the only case on the agenda, so we're going to start right away. And I ask both of you attorneys, no more filings. We know what the issues are. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. We stand adjourned.